Rob Wolf, uh, it's great to have you on, man. I've been, uh, I've been a fan for a while, and uh, it's awesome to have you on. Huge honor to be here. Thank you. Pleasure, pleasure. So how's everything going with you, man? How's your, how's your day been and everything? Everything's good. We, uh, we homeschool my, my two daughters, uh, seven and nine, which is, is uh, both a challenging but also a really cool experience. So this morning, um, my oldest daughter is working through a science section that is, is looking at microscopy. And so we're using a microscope on a bunch of different things. Then we actually have a little, little lake near our backyard and we went and collected some water and we're getting ready to see what type of critters are, are still active in the, in the water. See if we can see some amoebas or, or any type of uh, waterfowl parasites or anything that we know are, are in there. So just been doing homeschool and recording some podcasts. That's so cool. Man. It's so cool to have them, you know, doing that kind of stuff as well, right? Being outdoors, yep. you know what I mean? Using, using a microscope and stuff like that. But how is that, whilst we're on that topic, I'm just curious to know, uh, like the challenges maybe you faced, you know, over the, over the last year or so, obviously homeschooling. I know you're a busy guy, everything that's been happening, all the changes, you know, with the pandemic and stuff. Yeah. I'm curious to know how you've managed that. The, the, so we did it, we started about six months before COVID. All so right. we, we fortunately kind of, had a little bit of a process and we were kind of moving along. So it, it, you know, it was a relatively easy transition in that regard. Honestly, the most challenging part isn't the school. It's the other seven hours that they would normally be at school, like to hit the curriculum that we need to hit only takes an hour, maybe two hours total. Like it really doesn't take that long and, and they're both doing really well. And the cool thing about homeschooling, um, I'm covering the math and the science. Then my wife is doing all the language art stuff, but like if the kids don't get something with math, we just go back and do it until they, they get it. And, and I consider them um, getting it when they could basically sit me down and teach me how to do something as well as the instructor, you know, with the, the home guide does. And, and uh, even though that sounds involved, it's really not that much time, but because my wife and I do work from home and we have all these, these projects and whatnot that we're attached to, um, figuring out what to do with them for the other five to seven hours of the day is, is challenging. So we have to really, you know, block time off so that we can go do a field trip. Um, my daughters do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and some swimming, a little bit of horseback riding. Like that's kind of their main physical activities. Uh, they're just riding their bikes and jumping on the trampoline and stuff. But we have to figure out things that we can get them to do to kind of get them tired. And then we can plug into our work chunk. So we've got like maybe a two hour, period of time to like do some writing, do a podcast or, you know, whatever it is that we need to do on, on our side. So it, it's, uh, it's not so much the schooling that's a challenge. It's being available to them the rest of the time that they're not actually doing school, but that we actually, we need to do some work. Yeah. I always find that really, uh, I, I, you know, admirational because I haven't actually got any kids at the moment. Um, and I just find like, you know, people like yourself, could you do in so much, you know what I mean? how you juggle that, you know, two daughters, homeschooling, like you say, the other seven hours of the day, keeping them busy, occupied, happy, spending, you know, being present with them. And yep. then obviously all the stuff you've got going on, which we'll talk about now anyway. So hats off to you, man. I always uh, admire parents who, you know, cause I basically my upbringing, my mom was like a single mother. So I saw, I saw the struggles with that. Yeah, You know what I mean? Um, but just in general, just being around for you for your kids and, and actually, you know, yes, yeah, it's, it's an admiration. I, I, My I, wife and I have said multiple times that um, we have no idea how single parents do it. Like, mm -hmm. no fucking clue. Like, we, we reasonably have our stuff buttoned up, and then you add kids and the demands of, of doing that and everything, and we barely get it done working as a team and, like, needing to be a uh, a sole operator in that, like really hats off to those folks, like hats off to your mom and the people that, that navigate single parentship stuff, man. Like it, it's a uh, holy smokes. That's a lot. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I was just saying to a new client recently, actually, you know, literally the hardest job in the world, I would say, you know, yep. like forget about everything else, just being the, you know, raising kids anyway, seems like a hell of a task, with, you know, right. regardless is like the hardest thing to do, but obviously it's a single mother. It's uh, all father, you know, it's got to be really, really yep. challenging. But yeah, on that note, mate, just um, in terms of all the stuff you're doing, just give us an intro, mate, um, in terms of like what you do, what you're all about, because I don't want to butcher. Sometimes I'll do, the, I'll do the intro and I'll butcher it a bit, right? So sure. I'll leave it with you. 
Man, I, I've got my fingers in a few different pies. So I sit on the board of directors of a medical risk assessment clinic that is in Reno, Nevada. Uh, 10 years ago, we completed a pilot study with the Reno Police and Fire Department where we identified folks that were risk, high risk for uh, type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And once we identified those folks, we got them paired up with a health coach, got them eating better, basically kind of a low-carb kind of, kind of deal, better exercise. Um, better circadian biology as best as we could do. A lot of these police and firefighters are on shift work. So, you know, we do the best job that we can, but talking to them about sleep hygiene and whatnot. But that pilot study uh, saved the city of Reno an estimated $22 million with a 33 to one return on investment. And so I've just been working kind of in the background, trying to get this out both within, you know, municipalities, but also um, kind of corporate Kind of, kind of health thing, and it, it, it's had a modicum of success. There's a lot of challenges to selling and doing something like this, but that that's a piece of what I do. I've had my blog since 2008, I want to say. So, like the RobWolf.com website, 2007, 2008, somewhere around there. A uh, couple of podcasts associated with that. Uh, I am definitely not writing a book right now. Um, I I did that Sacred Cow book right up there, and. Yeah. Um, Great book, uh, easily the best book I've written in, in large part because I did it with Diana Rogers, but like uh, writing a book is kind of like having a, a near fatal disease that you're not sure if you're gonna, gonna get through it. Like it's a lot, everything else in your life just kind of, or at least for me, just kind of drops by the wayside and it's a, it's a massive commitment. So not really looking to, to work on a book. And then we have our Healthy Rebellion community, which is uh, uh, the goal of the Healthy Rebellion is to get 1 million people out of the sick care system. So it's kind of a, a paid membership site where we do um, three times a year resets and just kind of talk about the news topics of the day. Currently, 85% of our chatter is about COVID in there. So I had to move the COVID section into a completely separate area of the, the whole thing. And like you have to... Uh, swear to be thick skinned and not easily offended and you won't bitch at anybody. And then, then you can sign up for, for that particular thing. And, uh, and then I'm a co co-founder of uh, element, this electrolyte product that we started three, three and a half years ago. And the, you know, between dad and husbanding and trying to, uh, trying to motor through old guy jujitsu, that, that is what my, my days, weeks and months are comprised of. Oh, dude, let's talk about that quickly. Anyway, Element, you know, because I started taking your uh, supplement recently and it's just, it just goes to show, right? Because, you know, when you you don't eat much protein, might as well talk about this now in terms of yourself and I, I know you don't eat any ultra processed pr foods and neither do I now, right? I used to, <laughs> things have changed. Right. So, um, yeah. So for me, obviously getting enough just sodium, I, I, I had loads, I had two big meals a day, tend to break my fast later in the morning, you know, intermittent fasting or whatever, loads of salt on my meals. Um, but since having the, the, the obviously, because your supplement is sodium, a bit of magnesium and uh, potassium, having that when I hydrate in the mornings, especially before training, um, sometimes I'll just have it anyway. And it just gives me a big, a big boost of energy. So just yeah. talk us through that because um, I always communicate this to clients because obviously sodium and salt is, is still, a, people are still a bit, some people are still a bit worried about, you know, adding salt to their meals and stuff. So yeah, it, it it's such an interesting thing to unpack because sodium is recognized as an essential nutrient. You will die without it. Um, one of the challenges of fasting is that during the process of fasting, there, there is this uh, uh, process called the naturesis of fasting, which is basically the loss of sodium during a fast or a low carb diet. And uh, what happens is insulin levels tend to be suppressed and then that causes a down regulation in a hormone called aldosterone. And aldosterone causes us to retain sodium. It's one of several hormones that, that cause us to retain sodium. But people get really low fluid volume. They can get dizzy. They have super low energy. And that energy part is kind of interesting. We always kind of think about energy drinks as like some sort of caffeine mix. But when you really look at the cellular basis for energy production, the Krebs cycle, which is driven by sodium potassium pumps, Really, electrolytes are where energy comes from ultimately. Like they're the they're kind of the currency that allows that whole process to occur. So it, it's it's interesting just how important sodium and electrolytes are. But then when we look at the modern diet, people tend to overeat in general. 
They tend to overeat these highly processed foods and these highly processed foods are load, loaded with sodium. So we don't necessarily want someone who's eating a ton of super processed foods to eat a high sodium diet, although also eating a low sodium diet doesn't really help all that much. They've done studies on that and that's why the low salt diets are kind of unimpressive with regards to, to addressing hypertension and high blood pressure. But what's interesting is if we get folks to eat a less refined diet, their, their carbohydrate uh, and glycemic load decreases just because the quality of the carbohydrates are better, or maybe the quality and the total quantity is decreased, people end up reducing their insulin production and they, they tend to lose a lot of water. And this can be good for somebody who's hypertensive. They, they will normalize their blood pressure, but then this person really needs to judiciously add sodium to the diet. And that can either be, you know, vigorously salting food, although it's hard to do with just food, you know, all, all soups and stews and stuff like that, curries, I think you can hide more sodium and those sorts of things, but even uh, salting a salad, salting your, your vegetables and your meat and stuff like that, it certainly helps, but it's hard to get enough. And this is what my story was, 23 years of eating a low carb diet and not really uh, rarely ever getting the sodium right. And when I did, it was just by accident, not, not by design. And that it was figuring out the, the need for that sodium that was really the whole impetus for, for starting Element. And um, initially, it was just producing a free downloadable guide that was how to mix your own, uh, what we called it was a keto aid, how to mix your own homebrew electrolyte supplement. And within about six months of releasing that, we had like a half million downloads on it and people loved it, but it was kind of onerous to mix that stuff. If people traveled, they were traveling with three bags of white powder in their carry-on bag, which the TSA didn't really, you know, like that a whole lot. And so the, the people that were following us and followed this keto aid recipe actually said, why don't you do some sort of a stick pack? And so we looked into that and we did it. And three years down the road, Elements really motoring along pretty well. Uh, yes, it's awesome. And I've noticed because, you know, training and performance, right? So I've noticed I don't have any caffeine before training nowadays. So I just hide, I'll have a liter of water. And even if I, in the mornings when I'm not training, um, I tend to have a liter of water before I, and, and then I'll wait about 90 minutes before I have my coffee. I'll go for a walk, you know, try and set my circadian rhythm up. Uh, as you said, mm -hmm. just getting daylight and whatnot. Um, but yeah, with training, with the element stuff, I've noticed a mat and the pump as well. You've probably seen some of the posts as well. Yep. You know, in terms of the pump from the sodium, it's actually insane, Rob. You know, it's like, obviously, it's a good feeling when you're lifting weights, but the energy yep. levels are different, more sustained energy. And it's just simply from having that, you know, gram, a thousand milligrams of, of sodium and probably a little bit of potassium and magnesium as well. And drinking yep. that while I'm training, it's, it's awesome, man. Yeah, I mean, it was a... a and it tastes great. Sorry, I wanted to say as well, it, it tastes good as well, because that's in, like the watermelon, the raspberry flavor. If you mix that with water, man, it tastes really good, you know? It, it, it really does. And uh, I, I kind of joke, you know, there's nothing magical about the product. Like we don't make some claims that we have some super magical mineral rich sodium source, you know, it's just sodium yeah. chloride. It's mined in like upstate New York and, and it is good quality. But um, if there's any magic to it, it's that we really nailed the flavors and uh, it's convenient. Like the, yep. those, it, it, the formula is good. Like it, it, yeah. it's actually got enough sodium to do what we need to do. But thank you. Yeah. Like we, we spend an enormous amount of time trying to get the, the flavors right so that folks will enjoy it. Mm. I know this is a tough question to answer, Rob, because obviously everyone's so different in terms of how they eat their lifestyle. But generally, like I'm just thinking from my clients listening back to this now in the audience, would you say obviously hydrating in the morning is something I'm always, you know, reinforcing the clients a simple thing. We lose a lot of water in our sleep. You know, a lot of people sometimes get up, reach for coffee, don't actually hydrate first. Would you say for the most part, like adding a bit of sodium or having your supplement, for example, uh, with the water in the morning is most likely going to be beneficial having a bit of sodium to help with the hydration and, you know, stimulate your, uh, you know, organs and everything? Yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting. If you look in a textbook of medical physiology and we look up the term hydration, hydration means the water and the electrolytes. And so we really need both of those. And somewhere along the way, hydration became just water. And then we were given these recommendations of like eight, eight ounce glasses of water a day and, and you know, be terrified of dehydration and whatnot. And 
it, it's really hard to get somebody legitimately dehydrated. Like they will, they will figure out a way to get some amount of fluid in their body. But the, the interesting thing is that the amount of fluids that folks consume, like I love drinking coffee, I love drinking tea, but if there's not electrolytes with that, or if we're not eating sodium rich foods like salami or olives or pickles or something like that, then it's really easy to get so much water in our system that we dilute the amount of sodium that we have. And then the body will start dumping potassium to renormalize the sodium potassium ratio in, in the body. And this can make us feel awful. This is where people like uh, doing marathons and ultra marathons and whatnot, where they, they really hydrate a lot, but they're, they're only doing water. These people can end up in a hyponatremic state, a low sodium state that can make them very lethargic. They can pass out. And in some cases they even die from this. So it, it, it's a not uncommon thing to see people in military boot camps, uh, the first couple of weeks of athletic training, um, marathons, uh, triathlons, over consuming water and ending up in this, this really dangerous hyponatremic state. So I do, I think that, you know, like uh, a liter of water, teaspoon of some salt in it, uh, uh, you know, maybe some lemon juice just to, to, you know, spritz it up a little bit. I think something like that is, is really smart from a, a legitimate hydration perspective, you know, when we're, we're just getting things going first thing in the morning. But that said, if we know that we're going to get good amounts of sodium from the meals that we're eating and stuff like that, it, when we look at this, we try to look at the total electrolyte intake from all sources. So we look at dietary sources, we look at supplemental items like Element or just, just throwing sodium in your water and whatnot. And so uh, there are ways to, to drive this mainly from a, a dietary perspective. And it's basically making sure that you virtually all your meals have something really salty like uh, sauerkraut, um, kimchi, pickles, olives, uh, sardines, those sorts of things that really, really provide a, a decent whack of sodium in each meal. Yeah, yeah, that's a good shout, actually. Just obviously add in those foods, which already mm -hmm. contain, and especially sauerkraut and the stuff, fermented stuff, right? Obviously good for yep. the gut as well, uh, generally. Yep. So low carb then, Rob. I know obviously your first book, I think it was The Paleo Solution, was, was, was 2010 or something like that, right? Yep. Like over a yep. decade ago now, yeah. And um, obviously you said yourself, I didn't realize, you said 23 years you were pretty much eating like a low right. carb diet, yeah? Talk yeah. us through, I'm just yeah. curious to know what inspired you to actually write that first book and what was it that made you go low carbs? I know you're a big advocate and I actually, to be honest, I've switched the way I eat as well lately. I eat way lower carbs. I uh, generally feel better because I'm having more fats and animal sources and stuff. But um, yeah, I'm just yeah. curious to know what inspired you and got you into that journey. Yeah, you know, so I was uh, looking at either an MD or PhD track and... Uh, was doing just bench level chemistry in a, a cancer research center and developed ulcerative colitis. This was back when I was like 26, 27, uh, around 1998. And um, I was so sick that, so I'm about 170 pounds right now. And at the low ebb of my ulcerative colitis, I was 125, 130 pounds. So like if you imagine 40, wow. 50 pounds less of me, like I, I was a mess, you know, um, I just wasn't absorbing anything. I was suffering terrible malabsorption issues because of the gut inflammation. So my options were a bowel resection and or immunosuppressant drugs. And I just knew that those weren't good options, but um, I, I didn't know what else to do at the time. I was eating a, a pretty low fat essentially vegan diet. And, and I think for some people that works great. For me, it was a, a disaster. And in figuring out some options for my gut issues, I, I kind of settled onto this paleo uh, type template, this whole kind of, you know, interesting backstory with that. But uh, I first looked into information around a paleo type diet in 1998. In 2000, 2001, I found this kind of weird workout online called CrossFit. And I started doing that with my friend, Dave Warner, who's a retired Navy SEAL. And within, I don't know, three months, four months, we had like 15 people that we were training in his garage. And so I reached out to the Glassmans, the folks that founded CrossFit. And I said, hey, we, we love your stuff. We're, we're doing it in this gym. We want to open a gym and call it CrossFit. Can we do that? And they're like, yeah, go for it. And so that was the first CrossFit affiliate gym in the world. 
I ended up moving back to Chico, California and opening what was then the fourth CrossFit affiliate gym in the world. And I started working a ton with CrossFit and traveling around the world talking about nutrition primarily, you know, nutrition and strength and conditioning. And I, I was in and out of CrossFit a couple of times, just, you know, whatever drama that, that arose there, sometimes in, sometimes out. But I had this opportunity to go present this material to just thousands of people. And it was a, a one day, eight hour, you know, lecture on kind of evolutionary biology of nutrition and, and, uh, and the specifics around that and how to implement it. And I started writing a guide for that, you know, so that people could pre-read the material and I could go through it a little more quickly and then people would be better prepped to, to ask questions and whatnot. And I did a couple of years of that, it, just presenting this thing to tons and tons of people and finding out where they had questions and reservations. And just over the course of time, this book kind of wrote itself. And I, I was getting ready to leave to go do a, a talk. And one of my friends was like, how long is that guide? And I'm like, oh, it's like 113 pages. And he worked in publishing at the time. And he said, dude, you should publish that book. And given your following, you would probably get a New York Times bestseller. And I was like, Okay, so I, I kind of carved, you know, I started the process of really formally writing this thing, not just as a guide for a seminar, but as a book. And I, I think to the degree that that book was successful, it was really because of a conversation that I had with so many people. Like when, when I would write one paragraph or if people are reading one paragraph, you know, in like 80% of people, this question pops up. And I know it's going to pop up because I, I would, you know, do that in, in the spoken lecture and then I would get yeah. this question. So then I was able to immediately, you know, hold on, I'll, I'll get to that. And then I would get to the thing. And, and so wow. it was, um, it, it was really a conversation with like 10,000 different people and they're, they're both where they understood this stuff and also what they didn't understand, what the reservations were, the challenges of just kind of plugging this stuff into you know, a, a mainstream lifestyle. So I, I think that that was a big part of why that, that first one really stuck. There really wasn't a paleo diet genre before that book. Like for good, if you hate the paleo diet, then, you know, I guess I'm kind of the, the person to blame for that. But, it, uh, you know, there wasn't a book section, you know, at Amazon or in, in a bookstore that, that was paleo diet prior to that. Mm. Yeah. And as far as diets go, because I know obviously yourself, you, like you said yourself, everyone's different, right? Some people might do really well on a on a vegan diet, although that's probably right. a, probably a small minority of people generally. Um, some people do, but as far as you know, diets go, so to speak, you know, the paleo way of eating, um, which maybe you could break down for us, obviously, you know, like the hunter gatherer kind of ancestral way of eating. Um, so just going to see if you wouldn't mind just explaining. Obviously, we've got keto, we've got the paleo, um, and obviously, you know, low carb. So yep. how would you, I know? Again, it's a broad question, but in terms of the benefits of like those kind of two or three ways of eating, what would you say overall um, are the, the kind of the, the biggest benefits of eating that way? Because the bottom line is we did, we, we evolved to eat that way. Right. And I've learned that with my body over the years, you know? So, yeah, yeah. You, you know, the way that I break this stuff down, paleo is really about food composition. So it, it really tries to focus on uh, meats and seafoods, uh, fruits and vegetables, root shoots, tubers, but it's kind of agnostic as to the protein fat carb ratio. Like it, it you know, make it kind of protein centric. And then the, the, the fat and carbohydrate, you just kind of take care of based off of your, your specific needs. Um, a ketogenic diet is interesting and a little bit more amenable to scientific research because it has this really concrete endpoint. Like, are you in a state of ketosis or not? And they typically define it by having a, a blood a beta hydroxybutyrate level of, of 0.5 millimolar. So ketogenic diets have been really um, well regarded or yet more embraced within, say, kind of uh, dietary research circles. Because although the composition can kind of change and that can throw some variables in there, if you, you know, in science, we like to, to just have kind of one endpoint that we're kind of looking at and are you in ketosis or are you not? And then we can kind of go forward from there. So uh, paleo really has this eye towards food quality and then keto has these more specific kind of macronutrient ratios um, to, to get into ketosis, typically at least 70% fat 
um, if not more, maybe 20% protein and then uh, 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 less than 10% carbs. Although using the percentages gets people in trouble. People end up kind of screwing stuff up when they, they start from percentages and not yeah, the other way around. But, but the success of keto has kind of um, made it difficult for people to realize there's this whole spectrum of lower carb. You know, like we're generally told to eat somewhere around like 400 grams of carbohydrate per day, mainly from grain sources. Uh, uh, even a lot of sugar is kind of like, you know, given a hat tip on that stuff. So even if somebody shifts to something that's like 150 grams of carbs a day, you know, more of a Mediterranean uh, approach, more with fruits and vegetables, let's say, um, that's a shocking reduction in carbohydrate from what they were eating, particularly from like really processed foods, but it's miles away from being a ketogenic diet. And I, I think in some ways, the success of the ketogenic diet has kind of blinded people that there's this whole huge spectrum that we could exist in within dietary practices. You know, mm. if you feel like garbage eating, you know, 400, 500 grams of carbs a day, mainly from grains, but you feel awesome on 150 grams of carbs per day from fruits, vegetables, and root, you know, roots and tubers, you may not feel wonderful at 30 grams of carbs a day, just from like broccoli, kale, and spinach. Mm. But the the uh, popularity and the power uh, from scientific research of looking at ketogenic diets, I think is kind of um, made people a little myopic, like they've turned it into an arbitrarily all or nothing thing, whereas there's this whole huge spectrum of just, you know, lowering carbohydrate to, to potentially better suit the, the needs of people. And, and it's hard to sometimes remind people that this whole other world exists there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, from what I've seen, Rob, it's a good point. About 90% of people that say to me, you know, they're eating keto, as you say, just a little bit of misinformation. They're not really keto. Um, I heard, for example, like Rhonda Patrick recently, and she was really in keto and she was getting her blood done and all that kind of stuff. And she was like, yeah, in reality, I was not in keto when I thought I was. And that's, that's Dr. Rhonda Patrick. You know what I mean? So the people right. I speak to, I think generally they're just having lower carbs, but they're not in ketosis most people right because it is a lot more right. very kind of restrictive and almost um it, it quite extreme in a sense isn't it to, to stick to a keto diet like permanently right for most people generally that's not going to be sustainable but i know there can be benefits especially if people have got certain illnesses as well to treat certain illnesses and stuff but as a sustainability thing like, like you said 70 percent fat minimum just break right. that down for us what, what that is right because it's, it's quite a lot isn't it well, and you know, it's interesting. I think also as people, what I've noticed this, my good friends, Tyler Cartwright and Luis Villasenor have a, a online community called Keto Gains, and they do some amazing work with folks, body recomposition and whatnot. And they were one of the earliest people to point this out. But what they had noticed is that people had been eating keto for a number of years, you know, the low carb, at least um, their keto numbers would trend down. And this is something that uh, Finney and Volek's research also suggested that while people were on a ketogenic diet, their, their ketone numbers trended down. And what they attributed that to was that people were complying less and less with the ketogenic diet. And what we had kind of postulated on that, and I think that we're getting more and more validity for this, is that in the beginning, the brain needs more ketones, uh, the uh, gluconeogenesis isn't super efficient, so we're not producing the glucose from both protein and fats that we need. Um, not much of the fat is running directly on, on free fatty acids. But as the person fat adapts, uh, more of the body runs directly on fat. Uh, the ability to produce glucose via gluconeogenesis goes up. And so the overall need for ketones, I think, actually decreases with time. And this is where it can get people in, into problems. They feel fine. They're operating just fine. You know, cognitive function is good and all that stuff. But then they will check their blood ketone levels. And because it's not super high, it's not like a two or something, they will start eating less protein and eating more fat to kind of uh, goose that, that ketogenic process. And to your point, unless they have like a neurological condition or they're fighting cancer, doing some, some sort of adjunctive therapy where they really do want a specific ketone level, they start compromising their health and performance by eating less nutrient dense foods from, from protein sources and just adding more kind of like raw fat to their diet. So I, I think that um, 
it's hard operationally in a lot of ways to do a ketogenic diet, but then I do think that there's kind of a physiological adaptation that, that the ketones aren't as important later. Like if you're just wanting to lose weight, you don't necessarily need to be the, the person producing the highest ketones isn't necessarily winning because I could just go eat a big scoop of coconut butter and my ketones will go up, but I'm bur I, but I also just consume 300 calories of oil, you know, yeah, so yeah, that, exactly. that's not necessarily helping. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's like the, the bulletproof coffee in there. I've had clients ask me in the past, like, look, I'm trying to, you know, watch my calories a bit now and just maybe just eat a little bit less. Like I'm just gonna have one of these bulletproof coffees. You're like, that's like, you know, 150 calories or 200 yeah. calories of butter in a coffee. <laughs> you might want to, yeah. if you, you want to have that, but you might want to keep that 200 calories for something like you might enjoy eating with your meal. Or, or maybe a quarter stick of butter and then something that you chew, like some steak or some shrimp or yeah, something. Yeah, 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 that's like what I'm that. yeah. 100%. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just quickly on that then, um, I'm, I'm pretty, is this true, right? Because for me, basically, Rob, for example, now it's like 7, 8 a.m., I won't eat till about 11, 12, 1 p.m., 11 a.m. till about 1 p.m. And that first meal I have is, is really low carb, just super high, super high in fat and protein, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of normally red meats, egg yolks, avocado, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's my energy is at the best in the morning and kind of throughout the day. And then I have my, I'll have some fruit and stuff like that in the evening after my main meal. Does that mean potentially I'm maybe dipping in and out of ketosis potentially because I do feel sharp and stuff in the mornings as well? Um, I'm just curious. I know, I know it could be, there's a lot to that yeah. question, but I'm just curious. Yeah. I mean, almost certainly you're dipping in and out and even someone who is eating more of a standard American diet, like they'll get to the 0.3, maybe even 0.4 millimolar level of beta hydroxybutyrate at the end of an overnight fast. Um, the fact that you're basically carb cycling and you're physically active is, is going to factor into that. This is a, a Sami Einkainen. He was a co-founder of Trulia, and then Trulia was was acquired, and then he was a he is a co-founder and might still be the CEO of um, Verda Health, the ketogenic diet, you know, pro, uh, program for type two diabetics. And he did an interesting piece where he was doing some really hard road cycling, like just big wattage, lots of of time in the saddle. And he was eating 200 plus grams of carbs a day and was still at like a 1.5 millimolar. And, and so like physical activity is going to be a big deal. So the longer we take between meals, typically the, the, the more kind of ketogenic the process is, um, the, the greater a physical uh, activity level, um, the, the higher, you know, like the amount of protein and carbs we can eat and still be in a ketogenic state, but it's probably a pretty good bet that you're, you're dipping in, in and out of that. And if you feel good on both sides of it, I, I think the main takeaway is that you're metabolically flexible, which I think is kind of the holy grail for what we're looking at with this. You know, like if, um, if you were called upon to, uh, you know, supply chains bonk for a week and you have to like, you know, just not eat for four or five days, you could probably do it and it probably wouldn't totally crush you. It would suck in some ways, but you probably wouldn't have that super gnarly kind of uh, induction phase into the fast. It'd probably be relatively painless and, and quick. And then the flip side of that, if you needed to do a ton of physical activity, you could probably dump a good amount of carbohydrate in amidst that physical activity and probably be fine with it, which I, I, think is like what we would all like to be at. I think some of us have greater or lesser genetic capacity around that. Um, different epigenetic factors, like I think uh, antibiotic exposure can can influence that to some degree, like changing the gut microbiota and, and maybe making us less carb, carb tolerant than what we might otherwise be. But yeah, it sounds like what you're doing is some great metabolic flexibility work. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, on that note as well, in terms of like body composition, um, you know, fat loss and weight loss and stuff like that, obviously, you know, people are struggling more than ever any other time in human history when it comes to, you know, got more food available to us, less movement, yep. everything else. What would you say all in all, you know, in terms of like fat loss, because a lot of my clients and audience listen to this, obviously most people want to improve the way their body looks. So what would you say are the fundamentals? So I know in your book, what really stood out to me in Wired to Eat? And I knew this anyway, but the way you broke down the four pillars of health, right? So obviously sleep, nutrition, exercise or movement, and then, you know, social connections, I think you, you call it. In other words, community. Um, I know they're the four pillars of health, but what would you say generally um, people need to really focus on if they're looking to get leaner, healthier, 
and improve the way their body looks. Um, we, so I've had folks that have followed my work for 10 plus years, you know, and, and uh, they'll join our healthy rebellion community and they're still, you know, like they might report that they've had a benefit from kind of ancestral eating, but they still don't have the body composition they want. Um, we do a reset and as part of these resets, we'll figure out a, a macronutrient breakdown for folks, kind of figure out their calorie needs and whatnot. And when people are called upon to eat the protein they're supposed to eat, they're just jaw dropped. They're like, oh my God, I wasn't eating. They're eating half of what they were supposed to eat. And these are folks that are like into paleo, into keto, into carnivore. They know the importance of, of like animal proteins. They're not adverse to it. There's no, there's no drama with that. These are people that are bought in and they were completely fucking all this stuff up, you know? <laughs> And I'm not, I, I guess because I was a chemist and I weighed and measured everything in my work life so much, I'm, I'm not one of those neurotic people that wants folks to, to weigh and measure their food all the time. But man, if there's not power in that, that first week, in particular, paying attention to the protein you're consuming and making sure that you get at least a gram of protein per pound of body weight uh, 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 as an upper end or a gram of protein per pound of lean body mass as a lower end. And you, you know, a little bit less than double that for, for kilogram conversions. So I, uh, that's the thing. Like if, and if people don't hit that protein minimum, everything else is a battle because people tend to be hungry. They tend to overeat. They don't get that satiety signaling. Um, they don't get the, the proper body composition. So like the, you know, the, the pr hitting that protein on the dietary side is just a non-negotiable feature. It's, it's going to be almost impossible. You can get some progress with people, you know, if they're under eating protein, but God, it's hard. And, and it's really a, a struggle. It's hard for them to stick with long-term and you're, you're seldom going to get the really uh, super impressive body composition changes that you would see with adequate protein. And so that's kind of the dietary thing. And then just really uh, uh, focusing more on sleep, like going to bed earlier, improving sleep quality, uh, improve sleep hygiene. Um, if, if we really get on top of sleep properly and get better, you know, circadian biology and better restoration, the, the weight loss is magic then. And it, and it all goes together. It's not just that you're physiologically better at, at like fat burning when you sleep well, which you are, but your, your willpower is much stronger. Like if you walk by the cookie counter at some, you know, uh, uh, coffee shop or something you're like, Oh, cookies, those look good, but it's not like, Oh my God. Whereas if you've had just a, and this is the challenge of being a parent, you know, you have a, a kid watches a scary movie. They wake up in the middle of the night and are in, in your, your bed kicking and doing the exorcist thing in your, your bed and you have a terrible night's sleep. And then you walk by that cookie counter the next day when you're tired and cranky and, and really um, low ability to control your impulses. It's very hard to, to not do the cookie or the cupcake or, you know, whatever it is that you're, you're kind of wanting to do. So nail that protein and then really uh, uh, double up on, on your efforts to sleep better and magic happens with that. Yeah, we always, it's, it's the number one thing, right, Rob, really, as you said yourself, like, basically what you were saying is sleep is the foundation, right? Because even after one night's poor sleep, hormones can be all out of whack, you know what I mean? Yep. Because you're making yep. with food is likely to be uh, a lot worse, and totally agree with that. So, yep. yeah, um, and with the protein thing, right? Because this is a, I'm glad you said that, because this is probably the biggest battle I have all in all with clients, a few other things, but just consistently hitting protein. So what I find as well is, you know, some people are, oh, I'll just have protein bars and stuff, right? You know, like you're trying right. to get them to eat whole foods, you know what I mean? Trying to get more meat in. And what I, I don't know whether this is some sort of physiological thing, but generally I find females find it harder to actually eat more meat. Um, and because they, they're not used to it, I guess. I, I don't know whether yep. it's generally, I, I think guys generally just tend to eat more meat all in all. Um, but how do you kind of communicate that to them? Right. Okay. I, I'm struggling because that's a lot, right? That's roughly what I get my clients to aim for. Yeah. A gram of protein per pound of body weight. Um, and they're doubling what they usually do. How do you kind yes. of communicate that to them? And what, what advice do you give to them in terms of, right? Like eat these foods, you know, I know everyone's different, but I'm just curious. Just, it's a tough yeah. one. You, you know, I mean, there's, uh, there's the cell, like we got to sell them that you got to eat more protein. And fortunately we, 
we have enough success stories, you know, where you can be like, here's this person, they're very much like you, they were struggling, then they got on track with protein and then everything was relatively easy. So you got the visual transformation, you've got their, their written piece to it and the person's like, okay, but I still like, I, I get bogged down eating protein, what do I do? And what I've been recommending folks do is try not to get all of your protein from one source in a meal. So maybe it's uh, some beef, a little bit of chicken and a little bit of shrimp. So if the, if the goal is 50 grams of protein at that meal, maybe you try to get like, you know, 25 of beef and 25 of shrimp or 25 of beef and 10 of chicken and a little bit of shrimp. In, in my second book, Wired to Eat, I talked about how over too much palate option can actually allow us to overeat, you know, and this is like going into a buffet and we could go from like uh, salty, crunchy things like French fries to ice cream. And you can just like infinitely eat that stuff. And so that can be a problem. But when we are finding it challenging to get people to eat enough protein, there is a strong tendency for people to feel satiated when they eat protein. And, and so if you, if you're asking them to eat, you know, seven ounces of steak, you know, small female, that may be a, a big ask. But if it's like two ounces of steak, two ounces of chicken, two ounces of shrimp, that's a much more doable, you know, scenario. And particularly if they like cut it up small, make it part of a salad or something, get a little bit of good tasting dressing on it. So you get some, you know, some nuts for some crunch and everything. So you do a couple of different things like that. So you're not getting all the same protein. You're kind of mixing up the palate experience and it makes it way easier for folks to, to hit that protein minimum. Yeah, I love that. That's such great advice. And I haven't actually, I've actually tried doing that. I've said variety is important. You've got to yep. enjoy what you eat, but actually doing that in a meal is actually great advice. Love that. Very simple as well to implement. Um, okay, let's, obviously I could have spent the whole podcast talking about this, Rob, the sacred cow, right? Um, unfortunately, I went to order the book because I'm in Australia. I don't know what happened. I don't know whether it wasn't available or something. So I need to order it again now. So I haven't read the book, right? Okay. I'm going to read it and I'm going to watch the documentary. I'm just going to be honest. Um, and I've looked into what it's about and stuff like that. And um, talk us through that, man. I heard you on the Paul Saladino podcast as well, uh, breaking a lot of the stuff, this stuff down. But I'm always trying to communicate this to, to clients and people. I say, you know, it's bad for the environment eating, you know, eating beef and red meat. Um, but in reality, uh, it's actually quite the opposite, right? Rob, you know, obviously with the context taken into play. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, uh, man, how many different topics can one get canceled on these days? You know, if you, <laughs> yeah, if yeah, you end up on, that. you know, the wrong side of like a social justice discussion, um, just simply advocating for low carb diets, you know, you can be labeled elitist or, you know, all this stuff. And then, man, climate change, you know, if you, if you have any commentary anywhere around the topic of climate change, like, yeah, oh man, you'll, <laughs> you can end up in some trouble pretty, pretty quickly. And what, what, what I've suspected and then have learned over the last 10 years of really going deep on this regenerative ag story is that uh, the climate change implications of animal husbandry have just been like grossly exaggerated. They're totally taken out of context. There was a, a news piece that got wide distribution that some, some folks in a fairly uh, uh, high level position made the claim that 78% of climate change gas release is caused by cattle. And this just went everywhere and it, it, you know, it, it made it into news pieces and whatnot. When you really look at the reality of that, it's less than 2% of, of greenhouse gas emissions are attributable to that type of animal husbandry. And it's critical to understand that that is part of a closed loop system. The methane and the carbon dioxide that is released is from grass that just grew by sequestering carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And then as the cow lives its life and belches and farts and it releases both carbon dioxide and methane, the carbon dioxide gets reincorporated into plants. The methane has about a 10 year life cycle before it gets hydrolyzed into uh, uh, carbon dioxide and water. And then it, it enters this system. So the, the biogenic systems get a really bad rap. It, 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 and the dangerous thing that has happened is people have gotten so wrapped around the, the axle of reduce greenhouse gases at all costs 
uh, when people realized, oh man, termites produce huge amounts of methane. Maybe we should eradicate termites. Then folks discovered that shellfish on the ocean floor, which they, they do so many good things, they filter the water, they're part of the ecosystem, but they produce a boatload of methane. People were suggesting that we should eradicate shellfish. And, and again, these things are all part of a, a biogenic system. So this, that is just one of the, the topics. Sacred cow, we, we cover the environmental, ethical, and health considerations of a meat-inclusive food, food system. Each one of those topics probably deserves several well-written books, you know, just kind of unpacking them. But we did the best job we could to, to start with the health considerations, then look at the environmental, you know, claims like that uh, animal husbandry uses a lot of land and consumes a lot of water. And there's a lot of nuance as to what, what that actually means and what the real story is there. Um, and then the ethical part. And the ethical part isn't as cut and dry as, as folks suggest. Uh, a vegan or plant-based diet is not bloodless. The industrial row crop food system kills billions of organisms every year, you know, from herbicides, pesticides, uh, the, the combines that collect all the, the you know, the, um, the grains and whatnot and, and process them, uh, everything from invertebrates to, to birds and small mammals get, get killed in that process. So it, it's not a bloodless affair. And there's actually been analysis that suggests that the more animals are killed via the row crop system than would be killed if we shifted our whole food system towards large grazing animals, fruits, vegetables, uh, nuts and seeds, which ironically would probably be much healthier also, but yeah. would ultimately end up killing fewer animals. You sound like a crazy person saying that, you know, so the, it, the, the, the cool thing about the book is that we were able to really precisely say, okay, here's the claim. Here's the research around this claim. This is exactly what they said. Here's our analysis of this. And then if we're wrong, Here's, here's how you can address this. And by and large, we haven't had anybody come back and say that we, we got this stuff inaccurate. You know, there, there haven't been like huge, you know, takedown pieces um, uh, talking about that stuff. But it, it's really controversial. It's very, uh, can be kind of socially isolating because it, you know, people will paint you as, as uncaring because you, you have a, a different view on the way that this stuff should be handled. I believe in climate change. It's something that we need to definitely uh, address and be prepared for. But I think that so much of what goes into this discussion, particularly around animal husbandry, it's actually going to be dangerous because we're not, if, if what I'm saying is correct, then we're looking at things in a way that is exactly the opposite of what we should be doing to properly address climate change. Like we're focusing time, energy, and resources in a direction that's actually going to be counterproductive. Mm. Yeah, and it's a lot for you to unpack, right? And that, that, cause it's so, yeah. I heard you yeah. talking about it and I was like, right, I wanna make sure I, I sit down and watch this documentary properly. Cause I'm like, it's a complex topic and uh, there's a lot to it. So I think the best thing to do is, is it on, I think it's on Apple. I looked and it's on Apple. TV, isn't it? The, yeah, the Sacred Cow, the film is on most video distribution channels like like uh, Netflix, Apple. Oh, so it's on, it's on Netflix. Prime. Sacred Cow. I is think it? it is. I okay. think it is definitely. I think Amazon oh, that's Prime. what it is. That, okay, in my defense, yeah. in Australia, the Netflix is it's it's, it's only got certain. Things. It didn't have it on Netflix in Australia, but I looked okay. yesterday and they've got it on. Um, I think they've got it on Apple TV here, so I'm gonna okay. definitely definitely watch that because um, yeah, it's like with the environment as well. I guess you know. <laughs> When it comes to airplanes and bloody cars and pollute, like all the right. other things, steel, you know, creating steel for the house you live in. Like there's all yep. these things which beca because you've been brainwashed and obviously targeted by the media to, you know, believe that, you know, cows are the, I think, you know, it's, it, it's, it's really painful when you look at all the other things that could cause these issues. And like you said, even processed food, right? That's a whole nother conversation. Yep. Yeah. You know? And, and, you know, it's, uh, it's devilishly complex, you know, it, it, this gets a little bit peripheral to this, but, you know, people will do things like bringing a canvas sack to the grocer, you know, instead of getting a plastic bag, which I think is great in a lot of ways, but there's this ironic reality that you need to use that sack 20,000 times to have the same small carbon footprint as using one plastic bag. They, they've wow. become so shockingly efficient at, at making plastic and, and making it at these huge scales because it's not just the thing you have, 
It's all the resources that go into getting it. It's moving it around the planet. I think a lot of people have probably noticed in the time that they've grown up, like so much stuff has shifted from being packaged in glass to plastic. Now that seems bad. And there's certainly questions we should have around that. that it, glass doesn't really break down, but it, it doesn't do the same things in the environment that, that plastic does. But because plastic is so light, it has a lower overall energy footprint and carbon footprint than glass does because glass is so relatively heavy. So as a society, we have to ask some questions. Like if the goal is complete reduction in greenhouse gases, then we should be making everything out of plastic versus like steel and glass in, in, in so many different circumstances. But if we value a cleaner environment and cleaner oceans, then we may need to accept that we have a greater carbon footprint and we're going to be paying a larger price to be able to ship things around the world. And this is stuff that just gives people fits. One, the, the math is complex to like track all this stuff down doing what's called life cycle analysis. So it, it, it's, um, it's an onerous amount of information gathering to even get to a point where you can, you can have an assessment like that. But then it's kind of a buzzkill. Like you, you've got your canvas bag, you're going to go shopping, you know, you're doing something good. And then when somebody tells you, well, it's actually more efficient to just use a plastic bag because it, it's 20,000 times more efficient than your canvas bag from a, you know, like a carbon footprint perspective. It sounds crazy. You can't believe it. I mean, there's plastic bags littering the, the oceans and the, you know, the streets and everything, but there's, there's, this is the complex world that we live in. And it, it, this is another layer that um, people need to be prepared that they may have some, some of their own sacred cows that they, they have to figure out how to, how to contend with. Wow. I, mean, I, I wanted to give you credit as well, because, you know, like you said, then how many times can someone get, you know, canceled or get attacked? You know, cause all the stuff, cause it, I don't think people quite realize like what goes into the amount of pushback you must've had from like, for example, the sacred cow. Like uh, how much pushback and like obstacles did you face trying to get that out there? You know what, what's ironic about that, um, we've had no pushback from the vegan community at all. And we were braced for really? like a tsunami of that. Wow. And I think I could be wrong, but I think like, of course it's self-serving for me to say my book's good, but it, like we, I am really proud of Sacred Cow. Like that is easily the best bit of writing I've ever done. A lot of it was because I collaborated with Diana on this, but we, we started off and really we did the whole book doing our best job to disprove every single thing that we came up with in that book. And, and there were some, there were some zingers where uh, like, the difference nutritionally between grass fed meat and, and uh, conventional meat is not that big. Like it, it, it's tiny and it's not enough to really get wrapped up about. Are there sustainability and ethical considerations of pastured meat versus conventional meat? Yeah, but the, from a nutritional perspective, the, the differences between the two are so small, you can't really get wrapped around the axle of that. But the meat elitists, the people who are kind of like the grass fed meat elitists, hammered us like absolutely hammered us and and uh a, a good amount of the pushback that we've had is that we are shills for the the you know conventional meat industry and uh, we, we have no dollars that we've made from the conventional meat industry it's just kind of a reality that particularly with with beef it is just a really efficient nutrient dense source of food uh, even conventional meat spend 70% of its life on grass. And, and outside of the United States, most places mainly grass finish their beef. They, you have to pay more for grain finished beef. Like in Australia, you, you'll, you'll yeah. pay more typically for, for grain finished beef. The only reason why that doesn't happen that way in the United States is all of the really Byzantine um, farm subsidy stuff that we have here it creates this kind of false economy. But we had a remarkable amount of, of a pushback from kind of the meat elitist and then ironically, there was this kind of subsection of the, the uh, social justice, food justice scene that was angry at us because we didn't include enough of the story of BIPOC and other marginalized groups in this food story. And 
one thing that we said is, why don't we do a follow-up book on this? But we got like absolute shit response from that. Like people just got angrier at us. But we, we turned in a book that, the, the, that addresses the health, environmental, and ethical considerations of a meat-inclusive food system. Like, I mean, there's a mountain of shit there. There's a ton of stuff to unpack. It's very difficult to weave all of that stuff together in a cogent fashion and have you know, the first section lead into the section, section lead into the third section. When we turned in that book, it was 600 pages, the manuscript. And then the editors got it down to about 300 pages, which is right at the outer edge of what people are willing to consume in like a, a, a you know, a, a pop, you know, a popular, you know, publication type book. Um, you get much beyond that. And it, it, it just, it crushes the sales. Like people won't buy it. People will not read it because it's too, intimidating. Um, and so this was an interesting thing. These were people who were in the regenerative ag space, who believed in the practices that we were doing, but couldn't believe that we didn't take their specific pet project and make it the whole focus of our project. And I was kind of like, well, why don't you do that? Or why don't I do that with you? Or what can we do to, you know, facilitate talking about this? And they didn't want to hear any of that. They just did their level best to like nail us to a cross. And that was really fascinating. So the, the interesting thing that I've seen is we had far more blowback from kind of assholes within the regenerative movement than we did from the vegan movement. I think we did such a good job on the book in the film the vegan movement honestly didn't want anybody to even touch it. Like, it, you know, if you write a, a, a negative review, people have to at least go look at it and you will, some percentage of people will, will start getting curious about it. And we really did our level best to, to not make any claims that couldn't, couldn't super stand on their own. That the, you know, if the science was the least bit dodgy, we, we detailed what the limitations of the science were, and we didn't make overly hyperbolic claims and stuff like that. So we didn't get the, the onslaught of pushback from the, the vegan and kind of plant-based community. But ironically, there were uh, non-trivial elements of the regenerative ag scene that were pricks to us and, and continue to be to this day, ironically. Uh that is interesting. Yeah. I never would have thought that. That's crazy. You didn't Neither would we. That. Uh, and, and dude, it was, it was um, hot enough at the beginning of COVID. So our, our book launched in June of last year. So like right as all this stuff was like at, at peak insanity. And uh, we were getting so much hatred from these groups that I was kind of like, I don't even know why we did this. Like we, we uh, uh, we made no money off this book. Like it, it, it's, it, it's a very small subset of people that are interested in, in reading this stuff. It was definitely a, a passion project. But then when you add on top of that, that you had people like actively trying to get us like kicked off of, of you know, social platforms and, and uh, uh, you know, organizing people to, to complain to folks having it, like having us on your podcast or something like that. It's just like fuck. Why did we even bother doing this? You know, we we weathered the storm. It's a, it's better now. But it, we would have never in a million years dreamt that. Okay, you got this group of BIPOC folks that have been marginalized in farming, particularly in the United States, for a long time. That's a really important topic. Do you not see that what we did is at least create a wedge in this discussion, so that you guys have some space to be able to talk better about what you, you, your thing? Because if uh, if animal husbandry is made illegal or is taxed in a way that makes it impossible to do, it doesn't matter if if uh, somebody from a minority you know wants to get into farming. It's going to be completely economically inaccessible, even more more so than what it is now. So it, uh, mm. yeah, man, I don't know. It's a, it's been an interesting two years for sure. Like wow. really, really interesting. Yeah, yeah, I bet, I bet. So just quickly on that, just to wrap this up, grass fed, grass finished, right? Beef, for example. Uh, that is obviously in my head, that's what I go for. I eat a lot of red meat, to be honest. Uh, would you say then if you, cause I'd say to clients, ideally, you know, it doesn't make too much difference. But if, you, if you're going to eat a lot of it, I would say maybe grass fed, grass finished. And I know a lot of like most, most of them are grain finished for like the last 40 days or whatever anyway. So the yep. fine grass finished is like, I have to go to a specific place. So would you say all in all in the grand scheme of things from a nutrition perspective and because I know um, obviously what the cow consumes and stuff in terms of the grains and what can be on the grains, pesticides, all that kind of stuff, I guess can make a little bit of a difference, but it's not that important 
uh, really, uh, unless it's sustainability, obviously. I, 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 I see this completely as um, you're reasonably well established. You've got some extra money. Um, you you want to put some extra, you know, force behind the ethical and the environmental backing of this stuff. By all means, support the pastured meat scene. You're uh, a young family of four, just getting, getting, you know, making your way in the world and, and uh, you know, trying to feed your, your kids as best as you can. Um, whatever good quality animal foods, then fruits, then vegetables, nuts and seeds, that, that's how you do it. Like we, we uh, and it doesn't have to be organic. Conventional is, is just fine. You know, it, uh, uh, our, our health scene creates this situation where, there's so much elitism that, that folks trying to just do some better. The, the standards are raised so high that they're like, I can never do any of this stuff. So they end up not doing anything. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point. And it's, it's context and it's a level of priorities, right? You know, yep. getting in yep. your fruit and veg. Like if you're not eating much fruit and veg or you haven't got much money to get by, like you said, whatever you can manage and actually getting those foods in regardless of organic or, you know, getting the foods in consistently is going to be number one. And once you've done that, as you say, then it just depends on how far you want to take it really. But yeah, that was really, uh, you cleared that up really, really well. So I know how complex that is. Like you said yourself, 600 pages, you had to break it down to 300. Um, and obviously it just goes to show how complex this, uh, yeah. this topic is, right? So hats off to you, mate, for, for diving into Thank that. You. And just all the stuff you've done, man, like all the stuff to actually, you know, to, to, to go against what, the, you know, every, every, the government, all the stuff, that, not go against the government, but you know what I mean? Paleo, for example, right? You're going against the processed food industry you're always, you know, and, and to actually persevere and go through all that stuff. And obviously, you know, stand, stand by what you believe in and, and get the good word out there with health and everything else, mates. I, I just wanted to give you credit. Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, it's been fun. It's been a very interesting adventure so far. And definitely the, the last two years more than the previous 20 for sure. <laughs> yeah, I bet, mate. I bet 100%, especially with the sacred cow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, Rob, it was great to meet you, man. I really appreciate your time. And where can people find you? And anything uh, you mentioned? Robwolf.com is kind of the main main spot. I do a lot of writing for Element, which is drinkelement.com. And that's where you can track down pretty much everything I do. Awesome, awesome. Thanks a lot, Rob. Appreciate your time, mate. Huge honor. Take care. Take care, buddy.